So I don't know what, if anything, everybody heard. So I'm just going to go um, just kind of repeat myself. My name is Leisha Getson. This is the TDI slash Health Through Awareness October 25th, 2017 webinar. Um, as I said in the beginning, you should be able to hear me and our speaker and see the PowerPoint presentation. I'm hoping the technical difficulty has been resolved. So if you have any questions, please post them and we'll get to as many of those as possible, possible at the end of the webinar. So we have a very special guest this evening, our very own Dr. Philip Getson, a board certified family physician in practice since 1976 in Marlton, New Jersey. He's also a board certified thermologist and has reviewed more than 25,000 thermographic studies of the breast thyroid and dental studies. He also lectures internationally regarding thermographic testing and has authored several papers on the subject. He served as the Vice President of the Academy, American Academy of Thermology for a three-year term. And during that time he, term, he actually helped write the thermographic breast protocols, which have been accepted by the national and international thermographic com communities. Dr. Getson is also Assistant Professor of Medicine of Neurology at Drexel University College of Medicine in Philly. He's a member council on scientific affairs and des designated speaker for the RSD Association of America. In addition to being all that, he is my beloved in whom I'm well pleased and I'm very happy to have him here. Tonight, he's going to be discussing light bulb moments and the art of deductive medical reasoning. Welcome, Dr. Getson. Well, it's good. We've talked about doing this for a long time, and hopefully we'll get past the um, technical difficulties. And we'll talk a little bit about complex regional pain syndrome, which I will interchange with reflex sympathetic dystrophy, because that's the way I've been doing it for many, many years. So if you hear me say complex regional pain syndrome, or you hear me say reflex sympathetic dystrophy, I'm talking about the same thing. So let's see if we can get these slides to advance and we'll get started. So I, I'm starting with um, the deductive reasoning of Sherlock Holmes. And you will see through the course of the evening some of the uh, slogans, comments made in the Arthur Conan Doyle uh, writings of Sherlock Holmes, all of which contributed to what I have been doing for many, many years in the practice of medicine. Each fact is suggestive in itself. Together, they have a cumulative force. We're talking about trying to collect data and using that data to make a reasonable diagnosis. We have a situation whereby medicine has become so fast tracked and everything is done at such a pace that we have forgotten a lot of times how important it is to actually sit and talk to patients, how important it is to, to look at patients, to listen to patients, to use our five senses, to collect data in order to move forward and make the best diagnosis because without a diagnosis, you obviously cannot move forward and render treatment. So what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about different facets of the disease tonight based upon the data, based upon the facts. And if you have any questions along the way, um, please put them in the chat box and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. So, Complex regional pain syndrome goes back to the, the 17th century when King Charles IX suffered from pain and contracture following a blood letter procedure. So when people talk about this being a new disease, obviously it's not. It goes back to the 1800s. Then in the Civil War, Mitchell described soldiers as suffering from burning pain due to gunshot wounds. He called this causalgia. Around 1900, Sudeck and we'll talk about Sudeck in a minute, describe complications of trauma to the limbs. And he was talking about what became Sudeck's atrophy. In 1946, it changed to, to reflex sympathetic dystrophy, and it later became complex regional pain syndrome around the, term of the turn of the century into the 21st century. So these are some of the names, uh, causalgia, which I mentioned, Sudeck's atrophy, and I'll let you look at the rest of these names. And there are more than this. 
But down at the bottom, reflex neurovascular dystrophy is a term that is applied to this disease mostly in young children. So by definition, complex regional pain syndrome is a neuropathic inflammatory pain characterized by predominantly severe pain that is disproportionate to the inciting event. And this is something that many physicians who are evaluating a patient with this disease fail to understand. They fail to understand that a patient comes into the office and complains about pain. And a lot of time, these people are, indi are individuals who were involved in incidents or accidents where they motor vehicle or workman's compensation. And doctors tend to look at the patients and think, well, maybe the situation is one where this is a, uh, a, a an opportunity to get compensation. It's an opportunity to make some money on a claim. And so the, the patient is complaining about pain that is beyond the scope of what would be expected from the type of accident that they suffered. Well, this is the hallmark of complex regional pain syndrome, pain that is disproportionate to the inciting event. Also, the things include uh, edema, movement disorders, atrophy, and dystrophy, uh, all of which contribute to the definition of complex regional pain syndrome. Signs and symptoms, pain that is described as deep aching, cold or burning, and I've highlighted burning because this is the number one complaint of patients with complex regional pain syndrome. Increased skin sensitivity coming from such events as you see there, sprains, fractures, surgery, which should not cause pain to be as severe as that which is experienced by the individual. Allodynia, pain responses from stimulus that normally evoke pain, such as perhaps rubbing a Q-tip across the skin, which feels like somebody has a blowtorch on your arm. Hyperalgesia is something that should cause pain, but causes much more pain. Abnormal swelling, abnormal hair or nail growth, abnormal color changes of the skin, abnormal sweating. And you don't need to have all of these. You need to have some of these. And we'll talk about the Budapest criteria in a minute. But individuals, they come into the office, don't necessarily have to have hair or nail growth changes. They don't necessarily have to have color changes of the skin. They have to meet the criteria that will be described momentarily. And some of the differential diagnosis, differential uh, include diabetic and small fiber neuropathies, entrapment type neuropathies such as carpal tunnel syndrome, thoracic outlet syndrome, disc disease, herniations, cellulitis inflammation of the skin due to infection, vascular insufficiency, blood vessels that are not uh, adequately supplying an affected limb causing color changes, lymphedema, which is a condition causing abnormal swelling, costochondritis, which is a pain in the chest wall, or brachial plexopathies, which is probably the number one cause of complex regional pain syndrome, individuals having a negative effect on the brachial plexus, which is up in the uh, in the armpit area, the front of the chest wall, the back of the chest wall, and having limited motion in the shoulder and pain that extends across the top of the shoulder, across the top of the back, and certainly up into the armpit area. So we talked about the Budapest criteria. Well, this is a criteria that was established by a number of physicians who met in Budapest, Hungary, to try and come up with a common denominator as to who had and who did not have complex regional pain syndrome. And as you see from the first criteria, continuing pain disproportionate to the inciting event, which I mentioned earlier. And the symptom is what is reported, the subjective symptom, which is what is reported by the individual or the patient who is going into the doctor's office. I mentioned hyperalgesia and allodynia. We talked about skin color changes or color temperature asymmetry, edema or swelling, sweating or, or, or sweating changes, and decreased range of motion in any of the other motor function abnormalities such as weakness, tremor, uh, hair, skin, or nail change. Now, it is important to know that this is not something that has to be present at the time that the individual is sitting in front of the doctor but something that the individual has experienced at one time or another. These are subjective symptoms. Objective signs are pretty much exactly the same, but these must be seen by the physician who is examining the patient at the time 
of the office visit. And you can see from the, from the list that they're very similar in terms of symptoms and signs. And you have to have one sign, objective finding, in two or more of the categories. And number four, which I believe is very important, is there is no other diagnosis that better explains the signs and symptoms, which in essence is the rule out category that doctors use all the time. We're looking at somebody, well, what's wrong with this person? Well, I might not necessarily know what's wrong with this person, so let me have a differential in my mind. Well, it's not diabetes, and it's not carpal tunnel syndrome, and so on and so forth. Once you've eliminated all other possibilities, you're left with a diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome because there really is no other diagnosis that better explains both the signs and the symptoms of that individual. So a patient comes into the office with this disease, and it talks about migration or movement to all parts of the body. It talks about stabbing and shooting pain. It talks about being burning, affected by cold, humid weather, sleep interruption, physical and mental fatigue, excessive physical activity, physical inactivity, anxiety and stress. All of the symptoms that those of you who are listening to our webinar this evening have experienced at one time or another. Some of you have experienced some, some of you experienced most, some of you have experienced all. Other symptoms, th these include uh, irritable bowel and bladder, headache uh, and migraines, restless leg, uh, impaired memory and concentration, skin sensitivity and rashes, Renault's phenomenon, which is a bluish hue to the skin, and again, sleep disturbance and fatigue. So. Again, all these signs and symptoms that are very, very common, and all of you, that, again, with this disease that may be listening or, or people who know someone who has these are sitting there nodding your heads. Well, these two slides that you just saw came from the National Fibromyalgia website. And if you look at the National Fibromyalgia website and you look at the RSD Association's website, you will see an inordinate number of similarities between the two. And it is the theory that I have and the theory that, the, that these individuals have and have written papers on that fibromyalgia and reflex sympathetic dystrophy in many ways are one and the same disease. So when I have a patient come into my office and they say to me as a part of the history taking, well, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia two years ago, four years ago, and now they're presenting with a constellation of symptoms that very much sounds like CRPS to me. I'm wondering if that CRPS really wasn't there all along and it was accelerated by a traumatic event. Now, I'm not sitting here and telling you that they're identical, but the similarities are something that cannot be denied because it just showed you on those slides all of the signs and symptoms that the National Fibromyalgia website talks about as being their own. And all of you that I said are sitting there and nodding, there are so many similarities, it's impossible not to draw a correlation between these two diseases. That being said, if there are five or 10 million diagnosed cases of reflex sympathetic dystrophy complex regional pain syndrome in this country, and probably another five or 10 million individuals walking around undiagnosed, that number increases tenfold if we coupled into that the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. What about multiple sclerosis? Well, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that they're the same disease, but I am going to tell you that I studied nine patients, all of whom were female, who had both diagnosis of multiple sclerosis and complex regional pain syndrome, all of whom were seen by neurologists and all of whom were treated for their multiple sclerosis. And in treatment for the multiple sclerosis, nine out of nine had improvement in their complex regional pain syndrome, seven out of nine had improvement in their MS. So it begs the question, what are the similarities in terms of the area of the brain that is involved here? And how can we improve complex regional pain syndrome through treatments that may overlap in some fashion the treatment of multiple sclerosis? It is imperative to control concurrent medical conditions such as diabetes, hormonal imbalance, thyroid dysfunction, heart and lung issues, nutritional abnormalities, and any orthopedic injury. I had a patient in my office today who had an orthopedic injury to her foot, 
We talked about her treatment for a complex regional pain syndrome, and I explained to her that we had to fix the foot before we can fix the complex regional pain syndrome to the degree that we can do the latter. You must control that which you can control of an anatomic or, or chemical imbalance. You have to do that first because the, the CRPS is too much to control until you can control that which uh, you have a better option to get under, uh, under hand. If somebody has complex regional pain syndrome and carpal tunnel syndrome, you need to fix the carpal tunnel syndrome and so on and so forth. Control their diabetes, control their hormonal abnormalities, control their thyroid abnormalities. So what sets this disease off once you get it? What makes it worse? Number one on this list is stress. Someone comes into my office who's in relatively good control of their CRPS and I see them a week later and they're in a flare. My first question is always what kind of stressful in, in, insult occurred to the body? What happened that, that set it off? Someone died, there was a, a fire, whatever it may happen to be. Uh, stress is first and foremost the exacerbating factor. Cold temperatures, changes in barometric pressure, infections, especially dental infections, humidity, poor diet, which we're going to discuss a little bit farther down, vaccinations and, and the, the uh, aluminum in the vaccines, um, toxins as part of the vaccination, prescription medications, which will make bad situations worse, candida infections, specifically of the gastrointestinal tract, Lyme disease, and there are many, many more. This is just a list of things to look at as being things that will accelerate or exacerbate CRPS. Excuse me, Dr. Getson, but what is that, the disease, that name I can never remember that most people with uh, RSD have? It's not Epstein-Barr. Epstein-Barr, yes, thank you. We're, we're currently looking into the, the Epstein-Barr virus I am doing Epstein-Barr titers on all of my patients because it's a very common laboratory test and we're, we're obtaining uh, titers for Epstein-Barr virus. Every one of the CRPS patients that I have tested so far not only has an elevation of their Epstein-Barr titer, but in some cases is 10, 15, 20 times uh, the, the top limit of normal. And I'm not sure at this point in time exactly what the correlation is. I know that there is one. We're going to start looking at Epstein-Barr titers on people without CRPS to see whether there is a, a correlation therein. But it seems pretty much indisputable at this point in time that there is something in the Epstein-Barr virus that in some way is related to the complex regional pain syndrome. And is Epstein-Barr related to Lyme in some way? Does, does it Lyme come first and then Epstein-Barr the other way around? It, 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 Epstein-Barr generally comes first and it's related to mononucleosis oh. as well. Um, there are very great similarities. The difference between those two diseases, when you get mononucleosis, you're generally pretty sick for a period of time, fatigued and fevers and general malaise. When you get Epstein-Barr, it's kind of like you got the flu. It's a much shorter term, similar symptomatology. Uh, and so many, many people have been suffering from flu syndrome and in fact had Epstein-Barr virus along the way. So the full extent, hopefully we'll find out at some point in time in the future. Do many of the patients that you see also have Lyme disease? Lyme disease, the great masquerader is, is rampant in CRPS patients. And uh, again, it's something that we're studying. I don't profess to have great expertise in Lyme disease. We, tr I, we try to get people to individuals who are far better versed in Lyme disease but certainly if you have Lyme disease, it is going and you, you, you must treat active Lyme disease in order to get the CRPS under control for reasons that we talked about earlier about control of uh, concurrent factors. Thank you. So you may hear from doctors that, that CRPS doesn't spread. Well, CRPS spreads more times than not. In, in virtually all of my patients who are afflicted with this disorder from a traumatic event, what happens is that something happens to an arm, for example, and it spreads to the other arm or the leg on the same side. Dr. Schwartzman wrote a paper in 2001 talking about spread, and it can occur up to eight years later. Invariably, the second limb feels worse than the first. Now, I don't know if that's because the second limb is worse than the first 
or because people get used to the pain in the first limb. So by comparison, the second limb feels worse. But people will walk into the office and they will go, you know, my left arm hurts just like my right arm hurt. And, and I'll ask some more questions. It, it feels exactly like it did when it started, only it's much worse. So diagnostic testing for this disease, x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, I'll come back to bone scans in a minute, discograms, myelograms, arthrograms, laboratory testing, EMGs, all of those testing will tell you what is not wrong with somebody because none of those tests will definitively diagnose CRPS RSD. Somatosensory evoked potential testing may give you some idea that there is something wrong with the sensory ner nervous system. Quantitative sensory testing is not a bad test, but there are very, very few QST machines available. It has to do with testing vibrational sense and temperature sense. Um, it's a good test if you can find a, a QST testing site. Uh, I only know of one in the tri-state area of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, and that's a Drexel. So it's not well recognized or even well understood. Now, triple face bone scans were back in the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s, the, the quote unquote gold standard of diagnosis of CRPS. And for those of you who don't know what this is, it's the injection of a radioactive dye into a vein in your arm. There's an hour uh, that is left for the patient to sit and then an x-ray machine scans and goes up and down the body. And it, it's, it's like a, a scanner that we use in these days for um, a flatbed scanner. Uh, that being said, um, I have probably seen 1,300 patients with complex regional pain syndrome, and I've seen about six positive uh, bone scans. So I don't do them for two reasons. Number one, because the yield is so very poor. And number two, because I don't really particularly want to radiate people unnecessarily. I want to stick a needle in the arm of sun uh, an hour on, on thermographic testing for the evaluation of complex regional pain syndrome. I, I advocate thermographic testing. Those of you who are local know we do thermographic testing. Those of you who may be listening from outside the immediate area, thermography in my mind is the only diagnostic test that you should have to definitively confirm a diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome. And the reason is that thermography is a test for sensory nerve abnormalities. And CRPS is an abnormality of the sensory nerves. Not to mention the fact that we don't have to do injections, we don't have to radiate you, there is no contact to the body, there are no tubes like MRI machines, and we can look at a thermographic set of images and understand that a patient definitively has CRPS. I have done thermography on CRPS patients for the last 30 years. I have never seen a patient who clinically had CRPS who did not have a positive thermogram for CRPS. Moreover, I have seen patients who come into the office with one limb problem. Maybe their left arm is affected with this disease, and yet the thermogram is abnormal in more areas. And invariably, within six months of that thermographic testing, that patient is walking into the office saying, I feel pain exactly the same as the other arm in the, in the second arm or exactly the same in my leg. So it becomes almost a prognosticator of the spread of the disease. Now, in a perfect world, that would allow us to treat the second limb even before symptoms develop. But with insurance being what it is in this country, no insurance company is going to allow me to intervene and treat a limb that is asymptomatic. So at best, what it allows me to do is to get the earliest possible treatment for that individual once symptoms develop. For those of you who have seen thermographic testing, perhaps you've not seen a full body. For those of you who have not, I'm going to show you an image. But the great benefit of infrared imaging is it, 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 it images the nervous system. And it does that because it images the blood vessels and the heat patterns of the blood. And in thermography, in the first six months after an insult, the affected limb is going to show hot. And after that, it's almost, almost always, in 80 or 85% of the cases, shows a cold limb. So it provides images of the sympathetic nervous system. And because this is a disease of the sympathetic nervous system, it becomes a perfect tool. Two, two major articles that were written 
Interestingly enough, Dr. Brühl, who was mentioned in the footnote of the first article, was one of the contributors to the Budapest criteria. So here's, here's a case history. A 40-year-old female was seated in the third row of a football stadium. It was actually Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia. And what was happening was that the players would throw a football up into the stands and the players, the, the individuals in the stands would catch the ball and throw it back. And then they would move around and continue to throw the ball back and forth. Well, in this particular time, the individual didn't throw the ball. It was the punter for the Philadelphia Eagles and he kicked the ball into the stands. So it went way up into the uh, higher uh, portion of the stands and an individual caught it, and it was time to throw the football back. Well, this particular individual, I guess, thought he was Carson Wentz or a football uh, quarterback, and he threw the football, intending to get it down to the field for the kicker to kick the ball back up. Unfortunately, he wasn't Carson Wentz or a football player. And so what happened was he threw the ball, but it never made it to the field. What it did was it came directly to, at the face of a woman sitting in one of the first few rows of the stadium. Well, if there's a football coming at your body, and specifically at your face, you're going to do what you have to do to protect your face, which is you're going to put your hand up in front of your face. And in this particular case, this woman put her hand up in front of her face. The point of the football hit her in the hand. It drove it right into her face. It broke her wrist and it also broke her nose. So what happened was she went to a local hospital and at the hospital, they put her arm in a cast and six weeks later, they took her arm out of a cast and she said her arm felt worse when it came out of the cast and it went. Then when it went into the cast, well, they x-rayed her arm and found out that the fracture had healed beautifully. Unfortunately, she still had all this pain. She had an arm that was cold and purple. And she came into my office with the question, why is my arm hurting? And this is the thermographic images that we took. Now, on the right side of your screen is her left hand. And so you see, if you've never seen a thermographic image before, that these two arms, which really should be identical in terms of their color, look nothing alike. The left arm is colder than the right. And if you look at the table beneath the picture, you see a line that says delta average. And you see numbers that say 2.2, 2.0, and 3.0. The arm should never be more than one to one and a half degrees different from one side to the other. One is really the maximum. So in the spots that I measured, in the circles that you see drawn, this lady had temperature differentials that were two and three times the maximum acceptable limit of normal because her sympathetic nervous system had shut down. This is a classic thermogram complex regional pain syndrome. And this, and this is just to show you, now I go back to this one because she broke her wrist and she broke her left wrist. So when you look at that circle uh, with a four above it, that was the area that she broke. But she didn't break her upper arm. And if you look at the difference, the picture to the left of what you're seeing is her left arm. Okay. And again, you see a differential between the two arms, the left arm being much cooler than the right arm. Why? Because the sympathetics traveled all the way up to the arm. So I now have a definitive diagnosis to couple with the, air, with the clinical diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome to go ahead and treat this particular individual. Another Sherlock Holmesism: life is infinitely stranger than anything that the mind of man can create. I particularly like this because when you hear stories about footballs coming from the second a story of, a, of a, a football stadium hurling down at someone's face, it's not a story that you would expect to hear as a commonplace occurrence for complex regional pain syndrome. So here are some of the symptoms that we see and that I mentioned earlier that you can see. Vasomotor changes. The, the leg on the left, which was on the right side of your picture, is the normal leg. It's a normal color. There's hair on that leg. The right side is, is blanched, it, it's pale, there's virtually no color, there's very little blood flow to that leg, and if you look closely, there's no hair on that leg. Abnormal sweating, if you look closely, this hand is soaking wet, and in individuals who are afflicted with one side problem, the other hand in this case would be dry. Dystonia or a contraction of the hand, that hand is that way always. That's not somebody who's pinching their fingers together, that's the way the hand looks. 24-7. Facial dystonia. Uh, this individual has, has the, the muscles are contracted and the left side of his face is drawn up. And it's like this all the time. Now, interestingly enough, in this individual, 
for 10 days to 17 days after he receives the ketamine infusion, this goes away. And then after about 15 to 17 days, it begins to come back. This is, this is a, a young girl who uh, came for ketamine. And if you look at the top leg there, if you look at, at, at her left foot, you see that uh, it is dystonic. The toe is, is pushed back and her leg is straight out. It's almost like it's locked in that position. What makes this interesting is that she was sound asleep at the time that this happened. So she wasn't holding her leg like this. This was the position of her leg in an asleep position. After two weeks of ketamine, this is the same leg that is now relaxed and sitting on top of a pillow. I'm sorry, five days. I said two weeks after five days. So this is before we even began the ketamine. And you see how it's arched up and dystonic. This is five days later. This is what we call neurogenic edema. This is the swelling that comes from complex regional pain syndrome, not from heart disease, not from lymphedema, but from, from complex regional pain syndrome. The redness in the left knee is a hallmark in this individual that she's in a flare. This is, this is called levito reticularis. This is what this woman's stomach looks like all the time, except when she goes into a flare and then it all gets worse. And unfortunately, both her arms look exactly the same as her stomach. This is stasis dermatitis with a little bit of swelling in an individual where, where there's just not enough moisture in the skin and it dries out. And this is what happens as a result of the problem. Three days after ketamine, and I know it's not the best picture to look at, you see much of that dryness is gone. The discoloration is still there, but the dryness is not. This is an individual who, 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 at this moment, we still don't exactly know what's the matter with, but this is the distension of her abdomen, and it's this way all of the time. She's been to five gastroenterologists, and every one of her diagnostic tests is normal. Obviously, you know, the first thought if you saw her in, in clothes would be that she's pregnant. She, she had a hysterectomy, so pregnancy is not a possibility. We have done test after test after test and have yet to diagnose exactly what's wrong with her, except that we know that it's in some way related to her complex regional pain syndrome. So there's also systemic manifestations of the disease. Systemic means inside. So it's important that, you know, in the ones that we just looked at, you can see them. But you also need to talk to people and ask questions so that you can look at, at the person as a whole, that you can know that the things that are being described, symptoms, not signs, are related to the disorder. So from a gastrointestinal perspective, acetepic disease, ulcers, irritable bowel syndrome, intractable nausea and vomiting. We have these individuals get a, a gastroscope, endoscope. Sometimes there's mild irritation, but generally upper endoscopy is normal. Conventional treatment for ulcers or inflammation rarely benefits the individual. So you get gastroparesis. Now gastroparesis is the condition whereby food exits the stomach slowly and it doesn't get out. So the food backs up in the stomach, the food backs up in the stomach and, and there is this, this backlog of food, so the stomach blows up much the same as the woman you just saw. Uh, and, and it really is most common in diabetics, but it has become more and more common in individuals with complex regional pain syndrome. As such, you can see on gastroparesis, you can see gastroparesis on endoscopy, and you can also see it on an x-ray uh, test called a gastric emptying study. And the treatment has been to administer Botox into the stomach and usually one to three of these injections, which really are very painless because it's done as a part of the endoscopic procedure, uh, causes the, the sphincter to relax, the stomach to empty and the problem to rectify itself. We've only had two failures with Botox. They were both females and with nausea and vomiting and who became severely malnourished, lost copious amounts of weight and we could not make them in any other way. So that we had to surgically fix the stomach and in both cases it's successful. What made this really, really interesting to me was these two failures were sisters. Another interesting finding is patients with pancreatitis 
based upon laboratory parameters and clinical parameters. The number one cause of pancreatitis is alcohol. The second one is diabetes. The third one is trauma to the pancreas. None of these were the case in individuals that I have seen. And so we have diagnosed clinical pancreatitis as a consequence of their complex regional pain syndrome. Other symptoms are dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, indigestion, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, which more often than not is opioid induced, and biliary dyskinesia, which is uh, difficulty with the normal transition of food through the bowel. Urinary symptoms, uh, incontinence, uh, painful urination, difficulty voiding, uh, people who are diagnosed with interstitial cystitis who really actually don't have interstitial cystitis. Uh, sometimes the, the bladder pacemakers have been inserted. Botox gets injected into the bladder. That helps. Uh, we have found that lumbar epidural infusions of a hospital-based nature work very well, and ketamine helps as well in some individuals. Gynecologic polymenorrhea is, is excessive menstrual periods, dysmenorrhea pain, with menstrual periods, menomenorrhagia is pain in between, in between menstrual periods, and secondary amenorrhea is the absence of, of menstrual periods in individuals that have no other reason to not have menstrual periods. Obstetrical issues, patients in their third trimester of pregnancy and some even earlier become less symptomatic from their complex regional pain syndrome, and some became asymptomatic, tends to last after, into and after childbirth, and in some cases into breastfeeding. I have nine individuals that have had this happen. Again, we're not exactly sure what the hormonal balance is, but nine makes it non-anecdotal. An interesting anecdote was a woman who walked into my office and told me that she was pregnant. And I said, when did you get pregnant? And she said, last night. And I said, well, how do you know? She said, because I woke up this morning and I have no complex regional pain syndrome pain at all. And, and two or three weeks later, she had a miscarriage, unfortunately, and all her pain came back. Morton's neuroma um, is a, is a uh, nerve tumor benign of the second and third uh, inner space of the foot. It's not actually a tumor, but it's actually a thickening of the tissues that surround the nerves. It is more likely to occur in women than men. And I, I will tell you that if you have a Morton's neuroma, do not let a podiatrist or an orthopedic surgeon cut it out because it is a tremendous precursor to CRPS. It is painful. It needs to be addressed, but you can do this with cryoablation, which is the freezing of the tumor almost always, and you can avoid the surgery, make the Morton's neuroma asymptomatic, and not have it um, cut out. Vertigo is a common early symptom, sometimes positional and sometimes related to movement. If you get the underlying CRPS better, uh, the vertigo gets better. Meclizine sometimes helps make it tolerable while you are trying to get the CRPS better, but meclizine is very sedating. You have to be careful because it makes people very, very tired. Syncope is common. Syncope is blackouts or, or, or passouts. It comes from autonomic dysregulation. And it is not uncommon to have people simply have drop attacks, which leads me to this case presentation. A 44-year-old female with CRPS was involved in a motor vehicle accident, which makes her pre-existent CRPS worse. She has a brachial plexus injury in her accident, which causes her to have drop attacks. I mean, she left my office one day, got into the elevator and fell down. Uh, we had no idea what was going on, so we worked her up. We did a brain MRI, electroencephalographic testing, laboratory testing, ultrasound to her carotid arteries, and it was all negative. And ultimately, we made her better with a soft cervical collar. Now, I, I tell this story sometimes to meetings with physicians, and I get these very quizzical looks as to how you made somebody better with a cervical column, collar. Here's what happened. I sent her to the x-ray department a second time. She was actually in the hospital at the time. And I asked them to do an ultrasound of her carotid arteries. And they told me they had already done an ultrasound of her carotid arteries. But I asked them to do this one a little bit different. I asked them to do one carotid artery, then do the other carotid artery, then come back to the first artery with her head rotated completely to the opposite side. So when they did her right carotid artery, I had her look all the way to the left. And when, they, and when they did that, it was normal. 
and when he did her left carotid artery with her head rotated all the way to the right, she fell down and passed out. And the reason was that when she injured her brachial plexus, what she did was positionally she drew her shoulder up to protect the plexus. In doing that, she crimped her carotid artery. So one carotid artery was enough blood flow to keep her standing and moving. The other carotid artery, she had insufficient <laughs> blood flow. So when she turned her head in certain ways and cut off the good artery, the bad artery did not have enough blood flow to supply the brain, and as a consequence, she fell down. Once we put her in the collar, it stopped her from turning her head in the way that we did not want it turned, and she no longer fell down. Headaches, people come in and say they have migraine headaches. They're usually not migraine headaches. They're usually either tension headaches or headaches in the greater occipital nerves, which lie about two inches above the fingers on the technician's hand that you see on the bottom of that picture, right under the occiput in the back of the head. Uh, sometimes you can improve these headaches through chiropractic adjustment. Sometimes you do it through injection into the occipital nerves. When I do occipital nerve blocks, I use homeopathic agents. I do not use cortisone and Novocaine. I found that we get great relief from the homeopathics without the burning and, and the chemicals that are attached uh, to conventional medications. Visual disturbances, blurred vision, double vision, ocular migraines, loss of vision, um, photophobia, which is sensitivity to light, burning of the eyes. I have one patient who loses her vision in one eye. We give her a ketamine treatment and the vision comes back for four to six weeks. Uh, we are currently trying to figure out the association here, but she literally starts to go blind in one eye without the infusions. That big word at the top is your nose and throat, otophobia, sensitivity to sound. Patients will come in and say that their family is very upset with them because either they can't hear so that volume gets turned up, or they're so sensitive to sound that it gets turned down and nobody else can hear. Um, vibrational sense, I have patients come in and report that they're sitting in a car, another car pulls up right next to them. They, the bass is turned up on the car and the vibration from another car uh, will, will cause them to have pain from the bass vibration. Intermittent hoarseness uh, comes from the effects of the branchial plexus, not to confuse with the brachial plexus. The, the hoarseness is, is comes and goes. People will come in and they say, well, I feel like I'm getting a cold. I get hoarse, but only lasts for an hour or two, and I don't ever actually get sick. Dental disease is rampant. Uh, part of it is from dietary indiscretion, part from immune system compromise, part from disruption of the nerves and a disease that, that um, affects the nerves. Perhaps the greatest uh, reason is the medication side effect Poor diet, poor oral hygiene, poor nutrition, dry mouth from loss of saliva, all of which result in decay, periodontal disease, and ultimately the loss of teeth because they either break off or they get so bad in terms of their repair that they wind up being extracted. Dermatologic, I showed you the levito reticularis earlier. The second most common finding is neurodermatitis. Uh, which is pictured below. These look like small bites. They start out as small whiteheads and, and they progress to lesions that look like this. They're extremely itchy. So people scratch them even in their sleep. And if you scratch them, a lot of times they will scar. Other findings are dry skin and, and excessive sweating. Durkheim's disease is rare. I have been able to find one person in the entire country who has a Durkheim's disease clinic. She is a doctor in Arizona. Um, it looks like a lipoma, uh, which is a fatty tumor. And in fact, it is a lipoma, except unlike conventional lipomas, these hurt. And they are very, very painful. And they will respond to some degree to CRPS treatment. Uh, and when they come, they usually come in bunches. And they come, as it says, on the trunk, upper arms, and upper legs. There's no rhyme or reason for this. I've only ever seen two patients with this. But when they come, sometimes they're even more painful than the arms and legs that the patient complains about as being the primary source of problem. Podiatrics, I already talked about Morton's aroma. There's a picture of what it looks like and where it is. Cognitive dysfunction, the, the inability to recall and to think. Uh, Short-term memory loss, word retrieval, and difficulty getting words out. Some people theorize it's because of medication. 
but I've seen this in patients who take no medicine. There is no single answer. Part of it is because a lot of patients are absent from the workforce, so they don't have the stimulation of, of being, uh, it, it being necessary to, to communicate or think or do a job on a regular basis. Uh, part of it is because of uh, the, the absence of stimulation from uh, the workforce and lack of regimentation. And part of it is because we're not exactly really sure why, except we know that it occurs in this disease. We talked about this. Um, it has it long been a theory of mine that the little things are infinitely the most important. We're putting a diagnosis together. We're, we're trying to piece together a puzzle. Other symptoms, shortness of breath, which obviously comes from many, many diseases, inability to take a deep breath, neurogenic edema, which I showed you earlier, muscle weakness and atrophy, adrenal issues. Uh, and I can probably venture a guess that 100% of patients who are suffering from chronic pain and complex regional pain syndrome are also, also suffering from adrenal burnout, thyroid, hormonal imbalance, Gardner Diamond Syndrome, which is bruising from an area that was never injured, lethargy, fatigue, and sleep disturbance. Now, obviously, these, these are multifactorial. Uh, somebody comes in with short of breath doesn't mean that they, they have complex regional pain syndrome. But if we're putting the pieces together, each little piece of information becomes important. Genetics, you heard me talk about two sisters um, that, that were my two failures. Here's another story, a 37-year-old female casino worker uh, in the days that they actually had money in slot machines gets struck in the left lateral thigh and develops CRPS in that limb that winds up migrating to the left arm. A year later, her sister, who's a 35-year-old police officer, officer, was broadsided in her patrol car and the handle of her car door went into her left lateral thigh and she developed CRPS in the left leg, which migrates to her left arm. This is not coincidental. I have 18 families at this point in time with more than one member who has complex regional pain syndrome. I have only been able to ever find this one article that talks about uh, familial predisposition to this disease. And this particular individual uh, found 31 families to study. So let's talk about treatment. First and foremost, mobilization. Uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, recreational therapy. Movement is important. You've got to keep moving. If you can't move as much as you'd like to, move. Move your arms, move your legs, move your neck, move your back. Interventional pain management, injections, uh, infusions, uh, uh, different types of infusions, spinal cord and, dor and dorsal root ganglion, uh, stimulators, intrathecal pumps, radiofrequency ablation, and scrambler therapy. The scrambler therapy is, is the newest uh, treatment. The publicity for scrambler therapy has been terrific. The reports from the people who own the machines has been terrific. My own personal experience has been that while the treatment is ongoing, people do well, but the symptoms seem to recur very quickly after the treatment is discontinued. Now, again, this is not an indictment of the treatment. This is just my personal experience. Can you explain what that means, scrambler therapy? It is a treatment that is much like, um, it's almost like a giant TENS machine uh, where electrodes are put on different areas of the body and, and it pulses. Uh, and a lot of people can't tolerate uh, TENS machines because the pulsations become uncomfortable. So as a result, they don't do it. It is, it is different but similar. It's the best description I can give people. Uh, if you can tolerate the treatment, again, there are centers across the country that do it. It is not widespread. Uh, I know, for example, in New Jersey of only one center that has a machine. Perhaps there are more, but it, it, it's something that should look at with, with great caution in terms of what you can tolerate and what the long-term statistics are. Um, as far as the, the other injections, stellate ganglia, ganglion blocks, lumbar sympathetic blocks, it is probably necessary for me to sort of skim over some of these things. Uh, again, this will be posted on YouTube as a webinar. We can answer more questions in detail later on. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. If you're not sure what pre-alt is on the second one, that's snail venom, 
which is done on an inpatient basis and if effective can be put into an intrathecal pump. The DRG, the dorsal root ganglion stimulator is for lower body only and that's the newest of the spinal cord stimulators. Uh, medications, and there's a whole list of them. Um, Norigenate on, on the right hand side has a star next to it because it is not available for use in this country except in the Norigenate study. Uh, there is currently a worldwide study going on to determine the effectiveness of this drug in CRPS. It was studied in Italy in 21 individuals with good outcomes. The jury is still out because the study has not been completed. Lenalidomide is thalidomide and can only be given in certain places to women who are no longer of childbearing age. Um, and, and dextromethorphan is the DM in Robitus and DM. So many of these on the right hand side are used off label. Now, the reason that I put this in additionally is because I think it's important if you are going to take a medication that you take a medication for the problem. If you have muscle spasm, you shouldn't be taking pain pills. You should be taking something for the muscle spasm if you're going to take medication. And I keep saying if because there are other ways to treat muscle spasm. There are other ways to treat inflammation. And there are certainly other ways to treat depression. <coughs> Excuse me. A word about opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Hyperalgesia is excessive pain from stimulus that should cause pain, but not that much pain. And pain is associated with hyperalgesia allodynia in both. And so there is a known condition called opioid-induced hyperalgesia. The problem is that there is no way to quantify this. So there is no way to tell whether an individual has hyperalgesia that has been made worse by opioid pain medication unless you withdraw somebody from the opioids and their pain gets better. So it is something to consider and a lot of physicians are, are looking at this as a possible reason for excessive pain in individuals. And certainly if you increase your pain medication and the pain gets worse instead of better, it's something that at least should be considered. So a, a, a brief two minutes on ketamine, ketamine, has been around in this country since 1963. It was originally reduced, introduced as a drug for anesthesia in operating rooms. It is still used in operating rooms for anesthesia. Uh, it is a very safe drug when used properly. It has very low, low side effect profile. Uh, and it is uh, something that was anecdotally determined to work in CRPS patients in the late 1990s. Subanesthetically, it is used in burn victims. Uh, it, it, it's given to kids in emergency rooms because a, a child is not willingly going to allow you to remove a bandage from a burn. So they're given shots of ketamine. It, it takes in and, and sedates the child enough that he or she will fall asleep for a brief period of time. They wake up and they have no recollection of the change of the dressing, nor do they have any side effects. Um, it has been used in children, as mentioned, chronic non-malignant pain, and to some degree in cancer pain. It is given intravenously, orally, and topically. It is also given intranasally. I do not use it intranasally for two reasons. One, because it is it, the tolerance level is built up much faster intranasally. And number two, because there are reported instances of people developing urinary bladder problems, interstitial cystitis from intranasal ketamine. In surgery, Dr. Schwartzman and I wrote a paper that says in cases of known or suspected CRPS, you should always use intravenous uh, ketamine to lessen the likelihood of spread of the disease. And we found in a, in a small study with about 50 people that if you gave people ketamine, they did not spread the CRPS. 22 of the patients were mine and not one of them spread the disease. Psychological counseling, absolutely. The family unit should be counseled, especially the significant other. I am not an advocate of antidepressants. I think antidepressants uh, really have very little place in this disease. People are depressed because of circumstance. If you make them better, they get less depressed. And depression is generally a function of neurotransmitter imbalance. And I advocate, and we'll talk about it in a minute, balancing out the neurotransmitters to try and get the depression to be alleviated in a more, more appropriate fashion. 
Other treatments, diet and lifestyle alterations, gluten-free and anti-inflammatory diets, organic and healthy foods, cessation of smoking and alcohol, individual exercise programs, Reiki, manipulation and massage, acupuncture, vitamins and nutraceuticals, B12 and intrinsic factor, and hormonal neurotransmitter balancing. So Thomas Edison said the doctor of the future will give no medication, but will interest his patients in the care of human frame diet and the cause of prevention and disease. So here's seven foods to, to avoid. If you're going to start, here's, here's the, the beginning of the list. Artificial sweeteners, MSG and nitrates, sugar, and simple carbohydrates, caffeine, yeast and gluten, dairy, and nightshades, all of which the nightshades are, are highly inflammatory foods, and gluten, of course, is the most inflammatory food group. Uh, eliminate caffeine, alcohol, sugar processed food, stress, and smoking, which I didn't eliminate uh, on the last. Gluten-free diets, we have begun to explore the link between gluten-free and, and gastrointestinal symptomatology. To date, it, it, my patients who have made the commitment to go gluten-free feel better. It's just that simple. Gluten sensitivity is actually an autoimmune disease that creates inflammation. It can be linked to many, many diseases, and so you need to treat the cause of the diseases which may be as simple as gluten sensitivity and not just the symptoms. And this came from the New England Journal of Medicine. <clears throat> and this is just a list of some of the 55 diseases that were directly related to eating gluten. In the middle of that, which is not highlighted in red, is multiple sclerosis. All autoimmune diseases, which complex regional pain syndrome is, and fibromyalgia. And by the way, sensory ganglionopathies, which is something I'm not going to go into, is one of the theories that has been espoused as being the cause of complex regional pain syndrome. The last line is important. It has nothing to do with our, our CRPS topic, but gluten has also been linked to autism. So let me just get back to this for a second. When you talk about gluten-free diets, you can pick up a book and I will mention one later and talk about how to go gluten-free and it's a great start. But we also advocate holistic health counseling. We also advocate having somebody who is trained and understands health counseling to talk about changes in diet and lifestyle. Adjustments that you can make on an individualized basis. It's great to start being gluten-free. It's great to eliminate caffeine. It's great to eliminate sugar. But just like you would go uh, to a dentist for dental problems or a doctor for medical problems, seek the attention of health counselors, holistic health counselors, not dietitians, okay, but rather a, an overall health counselor who can help you with the entirety of, of the diet and lifestyle alterations. Neurotransmitter balances. Neurotransmitters affect every cell, tissue, and organ of the body. Uh, when out of balance, they cause physical, mental, and emotional uh, clinical symptomatology. Hormonal imbalances, cortisol, uh, estri uh, female hormones, estradiol, estri uh, est progesterone, testosterone, and melatonin. Hormonal imbalances need to be looked at uh, because a hormonal balance um, is, uh, uh, must, be, must, be recommend, uh, must be corrected. B vitamins. Low levels of folic acid, B12, thiamine, uh, and, and B6 have been associated with mood disorders. B6 actually is shown to create pain. Basic supplements. These are the basic supplements which in our practice we recommend uh, to our patients. Fish oil, probiotics, multivitamins and mineral supplements, vitamin D3, magnesium, and calcium especially to women, digestive enzymes, and hydrochloric acid to make sure that you have enough hydrochloric acid to facilitate digestion. And there are nutritional supplements which you can give to an individual which are not prescription medications, which act naturally to help the problems. 5-HTP is a painkiller and antidepressant. Uh, DLPA is an opiate antagonist, agonist quality. Methionine to help reduce pain uh, like antihistamines, fish oil, which we talked about, which is very similar in its properties to ibuprofen, 
B6 manganese and zinc to aid in pain relief. So here are some recommended readings. And, and one of these about, uh, about gut health, a couple of these about wheat belly, the diet cure and mood cure, all terrific things, adrenal fatigue. Uh, Dr. Price at the bottom who talked about uh, dentist, dentistry and uh, fascinating studies that Dr. Price did about indigenous tribes uh, and, and how eating real food and naturally made such a difference in their health. So I put this in um, because it has to do with positivity and attitude. Today I will find balance in my life. I will reveal my potential by feeling and being healthy, by embracing all the elements that are on my path to well-being. By striving for the best expression of me, I will find greater connectedness to the world than to those I love. Today I will live intentionally. We can talk about everything that I've talked about for the last hour. We can talk about it and talk about it and talk about it, but until you develop a positive attitude, until your focus is on being healthy, about being better, about taking care of your own self and being better, you, you're, you're working from a position of, uh, of negativity. You're working against yourself. You have to have that position of positivity. You have to wake up tomorrow morning and say, this I do for me whether it's diet changes or lifestyle changes, whether it's exercise, whether it's medication or, or in interventional treatments, it has to start with taking care of yourself. The, my favorite Sherlock Holmes quote, um, when you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. It, 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 I have seen so many people come in and say it can't possibly be that. Well, it certainly can be because we've worked backwards. We look at the things that aren't sometimes to find out the things that are. So this is my favorite. Now, I, I'm going to close by putting this up there, and I want to explain to you that, that at Thermographic Diagnostic Imaging Health through Awareness, it is a multifaceted practice. You know that at TDI, we do thermography, and people look at it that way. We also do holistic health counseling. We also do Reiki treatments. We also have an infrared sauna or a pod. We are trying to facilitate healing in a multidimensional way. It is very important that we do this. It is very important that you understand that you can come and you can get ketamine infusion therapy. You can come and talk to a doctor. You can come and talk to a holistic health counselor. You can come and be tested. You can come and get a lot of different things. And this is why we set up Health Through Awareness, because it is our belief that you can be healthy if you understand what it takes to get healthy. And once you have the knowledge, then you have the wherewithal to move forward and make yourself better in so many different ways. Well, thank you. That was a lot of information that you, you gave us in that hour of time and uh, folks, so it'll be available on our website and on YouTube if you wanna go back and look at it at your own pace. Um, as I said, lots of important information there. So thank you very much for that. We have some questions. We're going um, to get through as many as possible here. Well, the first question from Carol, what is the best treatment for CRPS? A very broad question, so we're going to try to keep it um, keep your answers. Okay. The, the best Please. treatment begins with finding someone who understands the disease. Uh, because any treatment that that individual recommends is going to be appropriate and hopefully more helpful than harmful. Uh, the second best treatment is, is an attitude of positivity. The third is mobilization. And moving forward, um, all of the other treatments that I glossed over and that will be available through review here become important on an individualized basis. So basically after you, if they were to come and see you and you do your, your history and your visit, and then you would come up with some sort of program or treatment program. Correct. Based on their individual needs. Correct. And where they are, how long they've had the disease, all of those things. So yes, there are things that can be done. There are always things that can be done. There are, 
because of the fact that there were so many um, untapped resources, because there's so much knowledge out there that's circulating, because there are so many uh, signs and symptoms that often tend to get unrecognized, it allows us to look and say, well, maybe the problem isn't what it appears to be in its entirety. Maybe the problem is, as I said, balancing gut health. And it's, a, it's something that a conventional approach to this disease is not going to deal with. Nicole says, it's a comment, insurance companies allow treatment of asymptomatic tumors based on imaging. Okay, I don't know if that's a question or a comment. Do insurance companies allow treatment of asymptomatic tumors based on imaging? I don't know the answer to that, so I, I'm not going to comment one way or the other. Okay, Nicole, we'll see if we can get that answer for you. Mia, have you had any patient with pain and swelling in their tear duct and the part that goes into the nose? I have, and it generally is a mechanical problem uh, in, the, in the tear duct uh, for which I would refer someone to an ear, nose, and throat special, specialist. And sometimes there are procedures that can open up the tear duct and help that problem. Very important if you're going to have that surgical procedure to do it under ketamine anesthesia. Bill asks, what tests do you do to detect a chemical imbalance? I think that you, that, that you have to go outside of the, con the conventional laboratory testing to do that. There are labs uh, in this country where you can look at chemicals. Uh, Metametrics Genova in, in Atlanta is one. Uh, there are others, and there are specific testing that will allow you to do that. They're usually not covered by conventional insurance, but you have to look outside conventional to do that, that kind of testing. There are panels that you can do. So looking at hormone imbalance or thyroid dysfunction, uh, neurotransmitter imbalance, maybe heavy metal toxicity, uh, mold toxicity, all of those Types of things. Every one of the things that you just mentioned, conventional testing for hormonal imbalances is really uh, not particularly accurate. That is covered by insurance and a lot of people do it, but saliva testing, urine uh, testing, really much more accurate and, and a much better way to look at all the things that you just mentioned. And mercury, as we mentioned earlier, is, is, is and aluminum are two great uh, problem creators to get overlooked by conventional testing. And the uh, testing for the MTHFR gene um, and maybe histamine, things like that, that would be uh, maybe a tribute to more pain. Correct. Okay. Tisha says, I have Calmere. Calmere therapy and it lasted for three months, but I still have a torn hip labrum that no surgeon will touch because of the CRPS? Well, the Calmare is the, is the, is the uh, trade name for the scrambler therapy. Um, the surgeon really should be told about the article that Dr. Schwartzman and I wrote about the use of ketamine intraoperatively because you certainly can repair a rotator cuff using uh, ketamine intraoperatively and the repair of the rotator cuff followed by intelligent physical therapy is of huge importance to improve the overall CRPS. Okay, Sonia asks, how do you feel about low-dose naltrexone for CRPS? Something I should have mentioned earlier, is that naltrexone is, is gaining a tremendous amount of support in this country for the treatment. Naltrexone is an anti-opioid. It is a drug that is used to block opioid absorption. Uh, it is very safe. It has virtually no side effects. Uh, it's taken once a day in very small dosage, and when it works, it works brilliantly. Uh, it has to be compounded because the prescription naltrexone is too potent and doesn't work the same way. But if you can find a compound pharmacist and, and a physician who will write low-dose naltrexone, it's certainly worth trying. Uh, obviously, you can't use it concurrently with opioids because the, the naltrexone will block the opioids, but if you're looking for pain relief, and for treatment of this, and you want to stay away from the hard drugs of the opioids, it's certainly a good avenue to explore. Mindy asks, can the onset of CRPS develop in multiple areas of the body at the same time? Absolutely. 
it, 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 it does, it, it manifests itself. It really isn't developing that way, but the manifestation is that way. Okay. George says, yes, tried no med after, and this dose not for me. The pain was still there. Not sure what that means. Not, I'm not quite sure what, what that means, George. If you're still on, on, the, um, on the webinar, maybe you could just do, do a little further explanation and... If it's a question, then I'll, I'll try to get to it. Tisha, again, um, I was diagnosed with early onset menopause at 37 years old. Could this be CRPS related? Because the doctor dismissed it when I brought it up. It, it could absolutely be CRPS related. It, CRPS will affect the hormones in any number of ways. Uh, and that's simply one of them that I actually may or may not have mentioned earlier, but any um, menstrual irregularity certainly has to do with hormonal imbalance, which is what we talked about and what you just addressed a few moments ago. Plus, depending on the early in onset of menopause or the, the CRPS related, I've seen many people, myself included, that a, a huge stress occurred in my life and I was thrown into menopause as a result. Uh, Sonia, I have CRPS. Should I have a tooth pulled instead of a, having a root canal? I'll, I'll let you do that. Uh, root canals, uh, uh, whether you have CRPS or not, you should not have a root canal in my estimation. Um, it, it, root canals really in CRPS are, are just horrific because you're, you're pulling out a tooth where the nerve root is partially or fully alive, most often fully alive, and, and I have seen more cases than I care to remember where the CRPS goes right into the face, in the area of the side of the face where the, where the tooth was pulled. So you absolutely should have the tooth pulled rather than the root canal and ideally with some ketamine anesthesia. So what uh, Dr. Getson and was uh, sort of a little bit of a, I don't know, chuckle there about the root canals because we don't we don't advocate root canals doing thermograms. We see a ton of infections in the mouth where a root canal has been done. And I've seen that uh, infection leading right down into the breast, causing breast disease. It can reflex to the thyroid and, and many different areas of the body. So um, root canals are something to be very wary of. And if you have a dental infection, it's affecting the whole body. So your immune system is getting constantly hit. Um, so many, many of the holistic dentists or uh, things that I have read about that, they'll say if you have to lose, you know, lose the tooth um, because you do not want that infection in the body. Tisha, I just bought an infrared sauna and I use it before I go to my acupuncturist for frequently specific microcurrent. How do you feel about FSM, frequently specific microcurrent. I don't have any experience with frequency specific microcurrent. So, you know, I advocate infrared saunas. I think the infrared sauna is great, um, but I can't comment on FSM because of lack of expertise in that field. Okay. Denise, CRPS and MCAS, what's the connection? I'm not sure what MCAS is. Denise, if you give me what MCAS is, I'll be happy to comment on it. Carol says, thank you. Uh, very helpful information. Do you see a cure someday for CRPS? I certainly hope so. Uh, I think that, that the research now is looking more toward uh, etiology. It is looking more toward the genetics that we're doing or the uh, glia in the brain cells, and, and I think that we're looking for ways to go more to the source than the symptoms. I'm encouraged by it, and I every day get up and hope that somebody comes up with something that helps us help people. Well, we, we've been very successful with the treatments you've used. We've been, I personally have been, uh, feel like I've been very successful with the people I've helped uh, or worked with doing holistic health counseling is something uh, which may seem as simple as eating properly, eating whole organic food, getting rid of processed food, gluten, 
sugar, all of those things has made a tremendous effect on the um, overall well-being of the patients I've seen with reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is to me uh, just wonderful when they just say they have an overall feeling of well-being. Um, Let me say something. Yeah. I, I think that that we tend to to, to piggyback on what Leisha said, I think we tend to look at this as it, it, many people do. I can't say everybody does as a as a solitary entity disease. I have neuropathic pain, and it is so much more than that. Um, it is it is such a combination of gut health and thyroid health and Lyme disease and adrenal health, um, and you know we don't have a cure for diabetes. But we have people who have diabetes and live perfectly normal, healthy lives because they watch their diet, they alter their lifestyle, they exercise, they lose weight. And in some cases, they take medication. Uh, and in some cases, they don't take medication. And, and I've often drawn a parallel between the two, not that they are in any way, in any shape, or form the same disease. But if you tell somebody we don't have a cure for CRPS, well, there's a lot of things we don't have a cure for, but that doesn't mean we can't make people better. Well, you may not have a cure for it, but you certainly can make life more manageable um, or improve the quality of life. So um, I, I would I would want to say that there's hope, not to, not to be hopeless about it. Okay. Julie, I've been on an antidepressant since May. Should I not be on it? Well, I, let me let me put this disclaimer. What I'm about to give you is my opinion. If you're on Cymbalta, okay, which a lot of people are on these days, it, my recommendation is wean yourself off and get away from the, that drug, because that's it's just really a bad drug. Um, people have problems with Cymbalta six months to a year after they discontinue Cymbalta. My feeling about antidepressants is that number one, it, it's a neurotransmitter issue. And you need to find out what the problem is and you need to balance out your neurotransmitters because if you balance out the neurotransmitters um, more of which are in the gut than in the brain but balancing out your neurotransmitters then corrects the problem which is the depression you know being a little bit depressed from chronic pain is understandable i mean it's not an abnormality you you've lost the quality of your life and people say, oh, you're depressed, you need to do this. Well, you should be depressed if you lose your quality of life, but you should really be working to improve the quality of your life and at the same time balancing out your neurotransmitters because the balance of them, okay, is going to make you feel better in an all natural way. I think also that when you start taking antidepressants, it says to the body, I don't have to make these neurotransmitters anymore because you're doing it for me. And that's not the message you want to send. And antidepressants over time just cause more harm than good. Agreed. Uh, Kathy says, thank you. This was excellent. Tasha, is there any benefit in having thermographic imaging done after you have a definitive diagnosis of CRPS? Um, two answers. Um, if you have a definitive diagnosis of CRPS in one part of your body and you develop symptoms in another part of your body, yes, to, to see whether those symptoms may be related to the sympathetic dysfunction. Uh, in terms of um, diagnostics, no. One, you know, once you know what you're dealing with, you, you, you know, although you can use it as a monitoring tool. Um, there is also a situation where, for medical legal reasons, you need to be able to provide an objective medical test to say, okay, I know that I have CRPS, but I need to prove this to someone, whether it's an insurance company or whatever. And so you, an objective medical test means that anybody who looks at it is going to see the same thing. It's not somebody saying, I have pain, but rather it's an objectification of the problem, not of the pain. Okay, Jennifer says... Have you seen scabs in the ears and hairline? And is the CRPS CRPS in my ears and head? They are on fire and pounding nonstop like a drum. My whole body is on fire and sweating and freezing cold constant. It feels like my head and limbs are going to pop off. What is this? Well, well, the head and limbs popping off is the CRPS. The scabs are because you're developing probably small neurodermatitis lesions in your in your head and your ears, or there's excessive sweating, and, and you get itchy and scratch, and you may not be conscious of the scratching, but you're scratching in your sleep, or you're, you're scratching when you don't even realize it, and that's why you're getting the scabbing, but it is a manifestation of the disease in the ears and scalp, and it is not uncommon. Okay. 
uh, Sally, where will your slides be available for printing a copy? The slides will be available in a day or so on our website at www. Well, the website's up there, tdinj.com. Go to our webinar page, and from there, you should be able to print it. Tisha, I did a saliva test through my naturopath, and it tested adrenal function, thyroid function, et cetera, and it was only $120 that I paid for, but my insurance let me put it towards my deductible. Call them and talk to them. Yep, great. That's um, a wonderful, wonderful uh, resource, naturopaths, to for testing, I think, Dr. Getson, and testing adrenal function, thyroid function, $120, it seems very reasonable. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you for that, Tisha. Denise, CRPS. It's the MCAS that we need to know. Yeah, it's the MCAS, Denise, that we, we, not, we don't know what that stands for. Dr. Getson, um, Helen says, Dr. Getson was excellent. Uh, Tisha, I've seen eight different surgeons, and none of them will touch it. Well, if you find one who's forward thinking, wherever you may be located, uh, if you're in New Jersey, I can certainly give you a surgeon who will treat it, or Pennsylvania, or even New York, if you're somewhere else. Um, then if you can find a surgeon that will talk to me, have him call. I will be happy to talk to him or her. Jennifer, can the pain you spoke of in the brachial plexus area be connected to a Chari one? Chari one malformations are, are, are generally not connected to the brachial plexus. They're independent, and Chiari malformations are generally asymptomatic and do not go hand to hand with CRPS, which is not to say it's impossible, but as a general rule, it does not. Mindy, is it possible to treat CRPS if there is an underlying severe deformity in bones? In the affected limb? I think that you can treat CRPS anywhere if you take the necessary steps and precautions. Um, you, you, you deal with those things that you must deal with to make the person go forward in a positive direction. You use the ketamine as a buffer and you proceed with great caution, but I think you not only can, but you probably have to. Diane says, do you know of AM? Don't know what AM I is. I don't know. Don't know what that means, Diane. If you want to give us a, a further clarification, Eileen, is it safe to do an Achilles tendon repair surgery on my affected foot and leg? It's again back to the same thing, which is you need to treat underlying problems. Uh, if you have an Achilles tendon tear, it has to be treated. Number one, because of the pain that it causes. Number two, because it's going to throw your gait off terribly, which is going to create problems up through your legs, your back, your neck. Intraoperative ketamine uh, and, and very uh, intense but cautious physical therapy done by a physical therapist who understands CRPS and knows how to treat it in a, in a safe, uh, efficacious way. Diane asks, do you know of anything that can stop our sweating? There, there are, uh, obviously, if you do something to make the CRPS better, if somebody sweats and they get ketamine and CRPS gets better, so will the sweating gets better. Other than that, there are, there are some products um, that I can't think the name of right off the top of my head that you can actually buy over the counter. They're actually topical powders um, that, that will actually work to cause the, the, the sweating to diminish in affected areas. But you're going to have to do a little research because I can't remember the name. Okay. Uh, just to, um, as an aside, when uh, we were talking about dental problems, some great products or anything that's made with xylitol. Xylitol is very good for uh, dental health. You can get um, throat, you can get mouth sprays. You can get something called xylomelts, which you can put in your mouth. Uh, while you're sleeping and it helps you to make saliva. Anybody on medication, the, um, your saliva, you stop making saliva, which causes um, damage to your teeth. And um, that's part of the reason that people are losing their teeth because they're not making the saliva from the medication. Xylomelts will help you 
continue to make the much needed saliva for your oral health. So you can check out any um, Spry, S-P-R-Y, makes tremendous um, uh, dental products with xylitol. Dennis, is there a possible link between CRPS and mild Volkmann's ischemic contracture? Where CRPS occurs in a limb and causes contracture. It seems that the treatment for CRPS and mild Volkmann's ischemic, ischemic, contracture. ischemic contracture is essentially the same with a focus on physiotherapy and anti seizure medication. The Volkmann's contractures are not very common. Um, but certainly from the one or two that I have seen, I agree with you that there is, uh, the treatments are very similar. And uh, if you're treating the contracture with the eye to the fact that you may have underlying CRPS and take the necessary precautions, I would think that you would have great success in doing it that way. Thank you. Lawrence, I had root canal and doctor injected Expirel right before surgery. Not sure what that is. Right? It's a, obviously a dental product, but one I'm not familiar with. So, Lawrence, I, um, we hope that was successful. We don't know if you want to uh, let us know whether or not whether or not it worked for you. Why are CP, oh, CRS, CP, CRPS patients getting mast cell activation syndrome? That's what the F M C A S stands for, Denise. Thank you for, for the information, the MCAS. And the answer is, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question because those people who are doing laboratory type research on CRPS are also looking at mast cells as, as an etiology. And to my knowledge, there has been no conclusion as to the interrelationship between the two. So my answer is that we're aware of it, but nobody knows why. At least nobody that I know of knows why. Okay, if you already have root canals done, should you have the teeth pulled, would that eliminate the problem with the root canals? You, if you, if you have had a root canal and it's asymptomatic and you live in a place where you can have a facial thermogram done, I would suggest to you that you do that because facial thermography will show heat, that residual heat in an area of not only a root canal but a crown. And we find that people have this residual heat and in that event, yes, I would suggest that you pull the tooth. If you have no residual heat and you have no residual symptoms, then at that point in time, I don't think there's a need to pull an already corrected asymptomatic area that doesn't have lingering inflammation or infection. There's a wonderful dentist in Hatboro, Pennsylvania. His, doctor, his name is Dr. Lou Travato. I don't know if you're local, Carol. Um, he also does uh, something called ozone injections. So I, it's my understanding, and I'm, I don't know this to be sure, that the holistic or biological dentist may try to do some intervention like ozone um, before taking the tooth. But as we said earlier, you don't want to compromise your whole body um, for, for one tooth. I know it's not a pleasant thought to lose a tooth, but when it comes down to it, that may be the answer. But look in your area, or as I said, if you're in this area, Dr. Lou Travato, uh, there's a wonderful dentist in uh, Texas. His name is Dr. Nunnally. So make sure they are certified holistic or biological dentists. Tisha, does insurance cover an initial exam with you, Dr. Denson? Well, um, if it's Medicare, yes. Um, workman's Compensation and Motor Vehicle in the state of New Jersey. Other insurances, we do not participate. Uh, mostly because I spend an hour to an hour and a half with the patient and the insurance companies were not on board with that. So we, uh, we do not accept insurance for that first visit. We try to work with people. And if you call the office like and ask for Diane, uh, we can have her talk to you and explain the insurance information directly to you. Can you give us the number for the front desk, please? The, the, that, that phone number is 856-983-7246. Again, 856-983-7246. Or if you call the number on the screen, we'll be happy to connect you with the front desk. Nicole says, to clarify my earlier comment, I meant insurance companies allow treatment of cancer tumors based on imaging. So why not allow treatment of CRPS based on thermal imaging or asymptomatic asymptomatic areas? Very good question. Yes, we wish we knew the answer to that. 
I, I, I really wish I knew the answer. Um, and, and, and there is no answer because the insurance companies simply do not. Uh, they're at a point now where they're not allowing uh, surgery on things that need surgery. So they're certainly not going to allow uh, asymptomatic lesions to be operated upon. Everything has become a fight in medicine, as I'm sure most of you know. Uh, and hopefully we'll see a time when that changes, but this is not that time. Uh, great, um, great question, though, Nicole. Tisha, I'm a type one and well and was well controlled until CRPS. I but I received ketamine in ER a few weeks ago and I didn't need insulin for two weeks. How interesting is that? I, I, I'm assuming that you're a type one diabetic, um, and uh, I, I think it's fabulous. I mean, I, I think that, that that that's the kind of stories that we love to hear, and we like to know that. Uh, controlling one thing has an relationship to the other. The amount of, of sympathetic dysfunction, how it's affecting your pancreas, the amount of stress, how it's affecting your pancreas, the amount of, of uh, the, the neurotransmitters effect from the diabetes and, and the pancreas. So I think it's great, and thank you for sharing that. Sonia, why, who do you recommend for thermography in California? Anybody off the top of your head? It would depend where you live in California. So if you will call the office tomorrow, we can help you with that piece of information. Or you, you can go on the American Academy of Thermology, put in your zip code and see um, who's in the area. Susan, good to hear the root canals are not good. I'm in the middle of one that was difficult according to the doctor and I have to go back and have it completed next week. Well, what do you say? Good luck with that, uh, Susan. We hope that works out for you. How effective is IVIG? Uh, IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulin, can be helpful. It's relatively simple to do. It's very expensive. Um, it is something that can be tried. There's no downside to speak of. If you can find somebody who can do it and you can get it covered by insurance, it's certainly worth trying. There's not a lot of literature to suggest how well it works. It's been, I, I knew a doctor back in the late 80s who was using IVIG successfully, so it's certainly worth looking into. Julie says, if CRPS is caused by the sympathetic nerve, can you not remove it to fix the problem? Please don't do that. Um, the removal of the nerve will cause an acceleration of the CRPS even if you do it with ketamine anesthesia. So you want to treat the, the, the problem to the best of your ability, whether it's with nerve blocks or ketamine or diet and lifestyle alterations or all the things you've heard here tonight, but do not do a sympathectomy. Thank you. That's pretty clear. Tisha, I see HSS in New York City for my hip labrum and Dr. Cooney in Rutherford, New Jersey for scrambler therapy. So going to see Going to New Jersey to see you is definitely doable. Okay, Tisha, well, we look forward to meeting you. Thank you, Dr. Gesson, for all the information. You are excellent as always. That's Helen Small from Canada. Canada. Hello, Welcome. Helen, thank you. Sally, per internet, MCAS, mast cell activation syndrome, also commonly referred to as mast cell activation disorder, is an immunological condition in which mast cells inappropriately and excessively release chemical mediators resulting in a range of chronic symptoms. Well, thank you for that clarification, Sally. We appreciate that. Mindy, thank you so much for the information, taking time to answer our questions. It's very meaningful, especially when it seems our own doctors don't listen, don't always listen. Well, our heart goes out to each and every one of you. We, um, Dr. Getson has treated many, many patients with RSD, and it's always um, uh, what can I say? It's it's hard. It's heartbreaking, um, but uh, we've also seen some some miracles and um, lots of people get get better and a better quality of life. Diane, thank you so much. Doctor Getson, bless you for helping us. Susan, thank you for taking the time to give the seminar. Monica, I'm on 400 milligrams three times a day of gabapentin. Should I stay on it? Well, the answer is if it's working, yes. Um, and because it's kind of the old, if it ain't broke, don't fix it thing. If it's not working, um, then you know, gabapentin is a drug that pretty much every doctor that sees their patient with CRPS, let's just put them on gabapentin. And GABA, of course, is a neurotransmitter. <coughs> Excuse me. So 
um, it's not totally without some merit. That being said, uh, again, I, I still advocate going back to the more the more natural holistic approach to trying to do it with balancing neurotransmitters, balancing the diet, things I've said over and over tonight, and see if you can get relief to get you off of the gabapentin and onto a more natural course. And I just want to say that there was somebody earlier that was on an antidepressant, Dr. Getson said to wean yourself off. I just would like to clarify that, do that under your doctor's care. Yes. Don't just take yourself off of antidepressants. Leslie says, hello, Dr. Getson and Alicia, spending this amount of your own time for education and to answer questions is so very generous. If I had access to this webinar prior to being seen by your practice, I would have been so relieved. This is a lifesaver to many on the webinar, literally. Thank you so much, Leslie, for those um, kind words. We appreciate it. Experl did work so far in my root canal. Dr. Prager did the injection. Okay, Robin, thank you for sharing that. So Experl, we'll have to look that up and see, um, see what that is. But we appreciate that comment. Jennifer, the scabs in my ears started in 2014 after MV, a motor vehicle accident. They did not diagnose me with CRPS until my hip and neck went out in September 2015. I fell and twisted my ankle and walked on a broken cuboid bone for three months. They diagnosed me with CRPS in December 2015. Any comment? Let's request slide up a little bit. Does this indicate that CRPS was this was there prior to the fall in September 2015? It certainly raises the suspicion uh, that it was, yes. Rebecca, I would like to know if there's any success with chiropractic treatment and nutrition for CRPS. <coughs> is, Go ahead. Is this an autoimmune disease? Absolutely. Uh, chiropractic intervention, again, uh, know the chiropractor, you know, you know, research research your doctor, understand his or her knowledge and expertise in, in what they're treating. But the combination of chiropractic care, which we advocate, and nutrition, which we wholeheartedly advocate, um, it, it, all of those natural ways to help realigning the spine is tremendously important. And, and we advocate this, but a, again, and I know I'm repeating myself, make sure that you're in the hands of somebody who has done their homework and understands who and understands yes, the is, disease of, of, of CRPS. Right. And yes, this is an autoimmune disease. So I just would like to say also that all of these, what may seem like little things, um, we have found in my holistic health counseling and in the practice that they all add up to big change. So eating properly, staying hydrated is so important, important. moving, whether it's chair movement or there's chair yoga, practicing deep breathing, meditation, uh, prayer, getting out in the sunshine, sitting in, in this, I mean, we've had some beautiful weather sitting in front of a window where the sun is shining in. Um, it's just, there's so many, what, as I said, would seem like little things that add up for, for big change. And it's a complex disorder and, um, it takes a, uh, an array of modalities to um, bring it under control. So, I'd like to make one comment since we now know that some of you who are listening are listening from out of our, our area, as is evidenced by the young lady from Canada. Um, if you go to the website that you see, the tdinj.com, you have the ability to sign up for newsletters and webinars. Uh, the newsletters come out the beginning of each month. The webinars come out uh, on the last Wednesday of the month, the fourth Wednesday of the month. There are archives on YouTube for everyone that has been done for the past two and one half years. They are something that Leisha put together and they are riveting. Uh, we have dentists, we have podiatrists, we have uh, holistic uh, practitioners. Uh, we have more and more people on this website that you can listen to and everyone is available for free. Uh, all of the newsletters are archived for free. It is a tremendous source of, of information, not about CRPS, but about a, a whole constellation of topics uh, that um, you will find interesting and informative. We do not uh, inundate you with, with emails. We send you an email with the newsletter. We send you one or two emails to remind you of the webinar, let you know where it will be archived. 
if you just want to get the newsletters and you don't want to sign up, that's fine. But I really suggest that you look into this, especially if you're out of the area, because I think you're going to find it not only very uh, interesting, but very informative as well. Denise, I have CRPS for over 10 years and have recently been diagnosed with MCAS, mast cell activation syndrome. Is it safe to be taking large amounts of antihistamines and H1 and H2 inhibitors? Doctors want to use, also want to use Singular and Ketif, uh, you know, Ket Kiffin, right? But my CRPS is getting worse. How would you handle the two? What is this word? Ketifin. Ketifin, okay. Well, there, there's a lot of question in this question. Now, taking H1 and H2 blockers means that you're going to minimize your stomach acid. And once you start minimizing your stomach acid, you're disrupting an already disrupted area. So your neurotransmitters, as I said, are in much greater uh, quantity in your abdomen than they are in your, in your um, brain. So that being said, now you've altered the gut flora yet again, and it, it certainly has the potential to make a bad situation worse. So I, I'd be careful of that. Now you're, you're talking about taking any histamines, which again alters uh, the, the biomechanics of, of the body. So in answer to your question as to how I would handle the two, I would take a step back. I would try and get myself to someone, perhaps even a naturopath, as we talked earlier, I would do as much neurotransmitter and hormonal testing, adrenal testing, and find out what the overall balance of my body was so that I could fix that and see whether or not fixing that and realigning and rebalancing the body worked on not one but both of the problems. Okay. Julie says, thank you. Lynn says, thanks again, Doc. Julie says, well, I will sign up as I'm in Canada as well. Great. Thank you. Welcome, Julie. Linda, thank you so much for all of your professional time and suggestions you say to lean toward the holistic approaches, which I love. But what would you consider a reasonable time to wean off of gabapentin? Literature says slow. Would four weeks be too fast? I know we should all console our docs. And the answer is yes. Consult the doctor because everybody is different and everybody has an individual uh, reaction to the drugs. I will say that four weeks on that dosage is probably about average, but I would not recommend you doing it because if you get off of gabapentin too quickly, it can induce seizures, and that's a problem. And that's what you don't want, right? So slow, slow and steady is better when right and when, monitored. And monitored, yes. Fila, thank you so much. Most helpful information. Thank you. Jennifer says, thank you so very much. You're amazing and a blessing and an angel. My GP has been rolling her eyes at me, gaslighting and trying to tell me I'm crazy. We hear a lot about that. We hear a lot of that. You make me cry. Thank you. I've been fighting since February 2014. I can't walk or drive and I feel like I'm dying. At least I know I'm not crazy now. Well, you brought tears to my eyes, Jennifer. Um, just, you know, hang in there and... Um, and hopefully tonight you got some information that will put you in a little bit different pathway to getting better. Yeah. I don't know where you're calling from, Jennifer, but I do do holistic health counseling by phone if that's uh, something you'd like to avail yourself of. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tisha, I don't want to step out of balance here, but I'm also a health care provider, and I will tell you that you need to research any medications a doctor wants to prescribe to make sure the cost-benefit analysis is in your favor. I, 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 I assume you mean risk-benefit analysis, and I agree with you. I don't advocate any kind of medicine without doing your homework and making sure that, that the risks outweigh the benefits, whether it's CRPS or any condition. Okay, thank you for that comment. Denise says thank you, and Jennifer says thank you. So. Okay, well, we went over time, um, but uh, I hope, and Dr. Getson went through this information rather quickly. It was a lot to cover, so you can go on uh, the, the archive and look at it at your leisure, and hopefully it's stimulated some thought and some, some hope for everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Our webinar next month will be held on Wednesday, November 29th, so we're going to be a week later. It'll be the week after Thanksgiving from 7 to 8 p.m. Our speaker will be Dr. Sue Massey. She's a certified naturopathic doctor 
as well as a certified natural health professional, and she'll, she will be talking about Lyme. Uh, so uh, please join us for that. Thank you all. Uh, well, let's just see. George's opiate meds are only are for only people that really need them. The people that take them make your life a little bearable, just bearable, just livable from insane pain. The pain is so bad that they want to kill themselves, and they should have them. And they should have them. They should look into the surveys and find out how many of those. Okay, thank you, George, for that. All right, everybody, good night. Thank you so much for joining us.